progress. So, good morning, brothers and sisters. Oh, we seek the Lord and his guidance as we open his word today. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for these Sabbath hours. We thank you also for your word and for the many things that we may learn from it. We need your guidance. We need your direction and we need your blessing. As we open your word, we seek you so that we may clearly understand your word and that which you would have us to know at this time. Please be with us now. Please guide us so that our conversation may lift up the things that we need to understand today so that we may be prepared to give a message to those that we care about, to those around us, so that we may be prepared with this message in character and in truth. Help us now, guide us, for we need you in all ways and all things. For this we thank you, for this we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right. Now, what we're looking at here, we've been we've been covering, looking over three days, the third day, the fifty-two days. All of this tied in with the minor prophets. Now, we're going to have a couple of things we're going to address today because of some portions of scripture that are very much tied to what we're talking about. So, we're going to start here with Exodus 19.1. And as it reads, in the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. What does that mean for you? What do you see here? Okay, so this is that, that issue that nobody really, um, there's a lot of disagreement regarding what it means the the same day. Okay. Um, so there's basically four different views. Okay. And one what is, are those four views? Uh, if I can think of them all. So the one is that it's the same day means it's the third day. Um, some people take it as the first day of the third month. Some people take it as the 15th day of the third month. That is, it's the 15th day that they left. Egypt, so it's the same day uh, of the month, and the other is that it's it's not referencing that in any way. It's just just basically saying on on this day they came into the wilderness of Sinai, or on the same day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. It was in the third month. So so there's four different views. Which which one uh, has been disputed for a long time? Okay, now that you've laid out the four views mm-hmm. in the study, how would you take this? I mean, I, I'll, be, I'll be specific. <clears throat> in this, I think the logic is showing from reading the verse and from reading other verses that, that have been gone over that this same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai would be no different than the basically the the second day of the first biblical 
month of, of, of the third month. So we'd be talking about the day in which they left Egypt that same day they come to Sinai in the third month. So you're saying it's the 15th? Very much. Okay. That would be my position. Yeah, and that and that's Stephen's position. Right. And and so I tentatively hold that position as well. Though initially my view was that it was uh, the third day of the month. Now, we know that it's um, – Ellen White talks about uh, them crossing um, – the Red Sea. So if we go back, so I'm just here on my, my calendar sure. um, inverter thing. So, so if we go back to, they're going to leave on April 26th. So that's going to be a Thursday and um, they're going to finish crossing the Red Sea because they're going to get there um, after three days. So, uh, the question is, wh which day would you put that they cross? Which night? Is it uh, the Saturday night and they cross Sunday morning, like they finish crossing, or do you have it the next day after that? Do you have it Sunday night that they cross in, in your three days? I would still be looking at it as being Sunday night, but, you know, a, a night after the Sabbath is possible. Okay. Well, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna count three cardinal days from when they left. Okay. And then we need a 50 days. Right. And 50 days is going to bring us to the ninth day of the third month. So if you're gonna take Ellen White's 50 days literally as 50 days, you wouldn't you would have to take the fourth view that it, it's just referring uh to events that happen on that day that they arrive there. It's on the same day that they, what was the words there? That it's not referring to the same day that they went out of the land of Egypt. It's just in the third month on that day, basically would be the expression. They came into the wilderness of Sinai. So <clears throat> um, if you're going to have the 50 days and then you're going to have um, well, I'm just counting cardinal days, right? So even if you counted three days, cardinal days, then 50 days, and then three more cardinal days, it would bring you to the 12th day of the third month. So it wouldn't bring you to the 15th, even if you, um, you know, so, so what Stephen does is he has it on the 15th, but he doesn't have three days journey, right? So this is just, this is where, you know, our human understanding, our limitations of knowledge, um, we have to try to put all this information together and decide how it all fits. But Ellen White does say it's 50 days from when they cross the Red Sea, and she does seem to put uh, the crossing of the Red Sea as three days after they leave Egypt. So that would put it probably on the 8th, according to her count, not, not even the ninth. So the 8th day of the first month. Well, okay, now, if I'm, if I'm looking at this correctly, mm -hmm. we would be in agreement that they would be leaving Egypt on the 15th day of the first month. Right, at the morning, just before sunrise. Right. And the 15th day of the first month would have been a fifth day of the week. Not the yeah. preparation day. Yeah, it's the Thursday. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so if I was to do an ordinal count, we would have the fifth day being the day that they leave they come here on their journey on preparation day. Then they would have the Sabbath. We know that, that the crossing occurred at night. Right. Okay. So 
if I was to say then that the crossing occurred on the 18th day of the first month. They would, they would be finished being crossed then. Okay. Right. Because that would have been the third night that they camped is at the Red Sea in, okay. in the one that we count that. So that means on the 18th, they have crossed it. So you could count uh, from there. You could count 49 days, I guess. Right. Because if you counted from when they began crossing to when they finished, because Ellen White says 50 days. Right. Right. And so then that would bring us to um, uh, the ninth day of Savannah, I guess. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, no, it'd bring, bring us to the eighth. So they would then be on the eighth day that they would arrive at um, Mount Sinai. If, if, we're, if we're reading this and understanding it correctly. Now, I mean, there are other ways in which we could try to interpret this statement um, in that uh, when it says, um, okay, the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day they came into the wilderness of Sinai, for they were departed from Rephidim and were come into the desert of Sinai and had pitched in the wilderness, and there Israel camped before the mount. So they get to the wilderness of Sinai, but they're also going to have to get to the mount itself. And based on my understanding of where Mount Sinai is and the location that they would have, because they need this area in which they would be able to place 2 million people, the only, the only spot that really works is Mount St. Catharines. Um, it has a big open area around the mountain that could that could hold two million people. Um, so the idea of the same day just means the same day that they came into the wilderness of Sinai, they actually got to the mountain is what it would be saying so that they didn't just get to the wilderness of Sinai and camp somewhere. They're actually going to get to the mountain and pitch before the mount all in that day. That's one way of looking at it, whether that's correct or not. Um, but yeah, we, we still have the problem of the time. So if we're going to take the 50 days and the three days, you would have to say that it can't be the first day of the month or the third day of the month or the 15th, because that wouldn't work. Unless we're misunderstanding Ellen White's statements, unless she's, she's speaking in a round figure or, um, or she's doing uh, conflation. She's including a, a whole bunch of time, which would be uh, something that people do. But, but anyway, that's, that's my two cents worth on that problem. So as we look at this, the third month, as we have been going through this with the, with the minor prophets, the third month does have something that is important for us to pay attention with, uh -huh. correct? Uh -huh. Now, <clears throat> the other verses that came up from Using Cruden's, we would have First Chronicles 27.5. So we have the third captain of the host for the third month was Benaniah, the son of Jehadiah, a chief priest. And in his course, there were 20 and 4,000. Yeah. So, so this is talking about the courses of the priests. Right. Um, so they're so they're marking out all the different months. Who's going to be the the priest for the first month, um, and then the, uh, the one that's going to serve for the second month, etc. So it, it's going to naturally uh, give us the third month because it's going to give all the months uh, except the thirteenth. They don't they don't count that one. Right. Okay. 
Second Chronicles 15.10. So they gathered themselves together at Jerusalem in the third month, in the 15th year of the reign of Asa. Why is this important? Uh, well, this is the reform under Asa. Right. I just don't know the context of the story. So they're going to get rid of their idols. Um, yeah, I'd have to look at the chapter. So can you give us some context on this? Well, let's go to Second Chronicles 15.10 and see what it says. Well, I read that, but chapter 14 is going to give us uh, the context. Really? Yeah. Okay. Is it a reform covenant? Would you repeat that, sister, please? Sorry. Is it a reform covenant? Co sorry. Covenant. <laughs> well, it is. Yeah, it's just um, after the death of Abijah, you're going to have um, Asa. He's going to reign, and the land is quiet for 10 years. Okay. And then he's going to do this work of reform. He took away the altars, the strange gods, the high places, break down the images, cut down the groves, and build fenced cities in Judah, for the land had rest, and he had no war in those years because the Lord had given him rest. So, so he begins this work of reform when he becomes king. And there came out against them, um, and Asa had an army of men that bear targets and spears. So this is Second Chronicles 14.8. Um, out of Judah, 300,000, and out of Benjamin that bear shields and drew bow bows, 204 score thousand. All these were mighty men of valor. And there came out against them Zerah the Ethiopian with a host of a thousand thousand and 300 chariots and came unto Marisha. So they're going to have this battle. And the Lord smote the Ethiopians before Asa and before Judah, and the Ethiopians fled. So that's going to be the context is they have this um, victory against the Ethiopians. And then in chapter 15, you're going to have Azariah, the son of Oded, who the spirit of God comes upon him. And they do a further work of reform. So they're going to make sure they get rid of all the idols. And, and they're going to gather together in the third month, in the 15th year of the reign of Asa. And they're going to offer 700 oxen and 7,000 sheep. And they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart and with all their souls. So that's 15 verse 11 and verse 12. Right. Now, I find it interesting as you're bringing this up, because Second uh, Chronicles 15, 19 mm -hmm. gives us a time frame. Because if we take a look at 15, 10, mm -hmm. so they gathered themselves together at Jerusalem in the third month in the 15th year of the reign of Asa. And by 1519, it states, and there was no more war unto the five and 30th year of the reign of Asa. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so we have a time period stated that's roughly 20 years. Yeah. So the reforms of Asa brought peace upon the land. Uh -huh. Would you agree? Yep. Okay. Now in Second Chronicles 31, we have the third month they began to lay the foundation of the heaps and finish them in the seventh month. What would be, what, what is important about the foundation of heaps? Go 
because this is under Hezekiah. Yeah, this is under Hezekiah. Um, but again, again, I don't know the context here. Because again, they're going out, they're breaking the images, they're cutting down the groves, throw down the high places and the altars out of Judah and Benjamin in Ephraim and Manasseh. Uh -huh. Again, it's a work of reform. Right. Connected with the third month. So this, uh, you know, the, the, you got the destruction of the high places, reappointment of the courses. Right. And the reestablishment of the ties uh, followed so closely upon the Passover. So the Passover is going to be before this. Right. And then they refer to the seventh month as well, the harvest being completed. So, so this is definitely a religious reform um, because they're talking about uh, um, the bringing in the fruits, the corn, the wine, the oil, the honey, all the increase of the field, the ties of all things they brought in abundantly. Okay. Uh, there's a wee comment on the study Bible. Uh, yeah. I said the seventh day is usually allotted to the Passover feast, passed all too quickly, and the worshippers de determined to spend another seven days in learning more fully the way of the Lord. As the great meeting drew to a close, it was evident <coughs> that the God had wrought marvelously in the conversion of the backsliding Judah and in stemming the tide of idolatry, which threatened to sweep all before it. The solemn warnings of the prophets had not been uttered in vain. At uh, Prophet and Kings 337 and 338. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and this is that reform that Hezekiah, when they made the call to northern Israel, so the Passover in the second month. So, um, so here in 31, it's after this Passover that was in the second month. So what particularly are the heaps? What is that referring to? Uh, just the, all of these offerings? That's what it looks like. They dwell in the cities. Okay. So, this is, so this would be the store, the, uh, the offerings. That's what it looks like to me from verse 6. So in other words, if we were to look at this, uh, specifically, the heat could this be such such as a uh, sheaf of corn? Okay. <clears throat> okay. So so basically, yeah, all this produce, the increase of the field. Okay, that would make sense because at first I didn't know what the heaps were. Um. Okay, so now we got the context there. Yeah, so it'd be the store. Um, different translations use different words. Just looking at what kind of words they would use here. So in this situation, in this third month, if they began to lay up the sheaves of corn, would this not be saying that they, it's taken them four months yeah so, yeah because they're finished in the seventh month right right, right. So, yeah so that's four months they begin uh in the in the third month because that's that's the harvest in the spring and they're going to continue to take these things until the seventh month when they have a harvest in the fall So we have this work of reform. We have an abundance of harvest. We have this third month that is tied very directly with portions of what have been called minor prophets. Mm -hmm. Now, Esther 8, verse 9. 
Then were the king's scribes called at that time in the third month, that is the month of Sivan, on the three and twentieth day thereof. And it was written according to all that Mordecai commanded unto the Jews, and to the lieutenants and the deputies and the rulers of the provinces, which are from India unto Ethiopia, and 127 provinces, unto every province according to the writing thereof, and unto every people after their language, and to the Jews according to their writing according to their language. Now, as we were covering this months ago in the book of Esther, this 127th is another symbol of midnight, 127 or 721. Correct? Uh-huh. So we're tying this back with time periods, with specific way marks that are important for the past history. So the question becomes, is this important for our history? Probably more so. I would agree. I would think it is very much more so important for our history. So what direction can we take from this today? This becomes part of the question that we're going to get into when we get into the second document. Now, the last verse that Cruden's used on the third month is Ezekiel 31.1. And it came to pass in the 11th year, in the third month, in the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying. And what is our context here? Well, these are prophecies against Egypt, if I remember correctly. Okay. Where Pharaoh is to be slain, while there is to be issues against Egypt, and we, we have been looking at Egypt as being the world, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. So taking these six verses together, we have a, a set of verses that are pointing to something that's going to have to happen in a third month. Something that we need to pay attention to within our line. Anyone have a problem with that? Okay, explain it again. What are you saying? Well, we have before us six verses. Mm -hmm. Every one of them has a reference to the third month. Mm -hmm. Which is where Pentecost occurs, is in the third month. And where we're seeing that there is a great reform. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. We're also seeing that this is the where the foundations are laid for the tithes. For the great harvest. We're also seeing that this is being tied by the book of Esther to midnight. And we have this time with Ezekiel 31.1. So is this not pointing out something for us on our line that we're going to need to address? Can I make an observation? Please. Can I make an observation? Yes. Um, okay, so I was just staring at uh, Second Chronicles 31.7. Okay. Did, did anybody else notice the 120 inside of that? Go ahead. 
Um, okay, for the third month. To the seventh, to the seventh month. month. That's four months, right? Right. Uh, four times 30 is 120. Right. That, that's just something that I, I noticed. I don't need to know if it means anything. It's just something that I noticed. Mm -hmm. Isn't that uh, have to do a symbol with a priest and the Levites? Yeah. It represents um, the priests. So if it represents the priests, does it also not imply a representation for the Levites? Well, well to me, it would be, yes, uh, you know, an allusion to it. Well, what, what we have with the, with the 120 days and the 70 days. So back in 2013, when they first noticed the uh, Ezra 7-9, um, Jeff was counting 120 days because there's 30 days in a month, at least prophetically, though there's actually 29 and a half. So, so he was looking at the period of 120 days and the period of 70 days and dividing this as the priests and the Levites. This was, this is how we came to understand this. Now, if, if this movement is the priests, that 120 days represents, um, the period of time in which uh, Sam, before Samuel Snow's message is empowered, because it's going to be empowered on the first day of the fifth month, after a period of 120 days from the first disappointment. So 120 days into the tarrying time. Now, understanding Samuel Snow's letters and his message aligning with us, one of the things that he notices is the midst of the week. And, and what is the, the symbol for the midst of the week that we see when, when we study it, um, when we study the 70 weeks, what's on the 1863 chart? What's the midst of the week? The cross. Okay. What year? Uh, 33, wasn't it? 31. 31 in the midst of the week. What do you see in second Chronicles 31 verse seven? Midst of the week. Right. So plus the 120, the four months. Mm -hmm. So you have that the same symbol tied there. So just adding to what you've been saying. So in other words, what we have here, are multiple symbols mm -hmm. dealing with this movement and with the priests for the message that is to be given at this time. Yeah. Yeah. And also we, we have to remind ourselves. So we already kind of referenced this, but remember uh, second Chronicles 29 is the cleansing of the temple that occurs for the priests sanctifying the, the house um, for eight days and the Levites, the court, courtyard, for eight days. Right? Right. So you have the priests and the Levites there as these two separate classes. And, and then there's this invitation to northern Israel that happens. And this is a couple of years prior to the captivity of Hoshea. So about four years or so before uh Samaria is destroyed. So they're making an invitation to northern Israel, to Ephraim, uh, for this Passover. And many, many come to this Passover. So we know that this is what our message is about. Uh, part of our message, at least, is a call to northern Israel, which is to the Protestants. But it's done by the priests and the Levites. But first the priests cleanse the house and then the Levites cleanse the courtyard, right? Now, that is, the priests, they're going to be cleaning the, the house, the Levites, technically, just in a, a technical sense. They're going to be carrying out the stuff. So the priests are working in cleaning it. The Levites are still helping them. But then the Levites, after they clean the house, the temple, then they're going to clean around it. 
And, and both of those take eight days. And Jeff made a application of these eight days. So back in 2018 at the camp meeting, Jeff kept trying to present on the eight days. And he never got to present on the eight days until after the camp meeting in November. And the way that he presented the eight days was after we already had July 18th, and he looked at the 252 days from November 9th to July 18th, he divided it into, into half of two periods of 1226 days. There. Uh, so he divided this um, 250 days into two periods of 126 days. Right. Now the center date uh, between there is um, uh, March 14th. That's halfway between uh, November 9th and uh, July 18th. But the Julian date is, <coughs> is March 1st, and March 1st is the third month, as is March 14th. But it's also the first day of the third month, which is a simple symbol of the midst of the week. Right, 31. So, so that was noted when we were there, when I was there, and Jeff was presenting this. I noted this, you know, that the significance of the center date. But we can see it's the third month is the center of that. Um, right. And, and I believe that, that March 14th, um, 2020 is uh, – 1,000 or 18,720 days from when uh, Stephen Jameson was born. Uh, okay. I, I believe I could be wrong on that. It could have been another date. Maybe that was May. I got to figure that out. But anyway, there was a significance. There's at least this significance. Yeah, I should, I should maybe, because maybe that was May 14th, not March. But anyway, we have this third month. Um, yeah, I think it's May, not March. Yeah, that would be May if I'm going to count, because it's going to be 273 days. Um, yeah, so that one's incorrect. But anyway, we have the significance of this symbol, and we know that this is this is about our message. But this message, we expected that we were further along in our message than we were. Correct very much and and so now we're trying to sort this out so i'm just checking this yeah it's may 14th 2020 anyway um now also the significance of of the second passover so what was the significance of the second passover does anybody remember well if anyone had been on a trip or had touched a dead body that allowed them to celebrate that Passover. Okay. So in the year that Hezekiah has his Passover, because they're cleansing the temple during the time that they would have the Passover, they're going to delay it to the second month. So they have this uh, uh, contingency set aside that they then take an advantage of. Correct? Right. Okay. And now, We've applied that to our movement. And how have we applied it to our movement? There's actually a couple of ways. Well, it's not that we've been on a journey, but we definitely have not uh, been clean at the time that uh, the first Passover occurred. Okay. Well, in Millerite history, there's two Passovers, is there not? Okay. Right. There's the one on April 3rd where Samuel, Samuel Snow's first letter is republished. Okay. And, and, and then there's the actual Passover, uh, May 2nd, which uh, is the publication of his second letter. And between that is April 19th, between those two Passovers. And they become a symbol of a division or a separation between the two classes, between the Protestants and the Millerites. We also have an application um, in regard to the dark day. So I, I did a paper on that, and that one I don't want to go into right now because it's a lot of detail. 
but we also made an application that applied to our movement as well. Um, so, uh, because the dark day is going to happen on a second Passover. And relates to our history. So, so when we have a second Passover, of course, that's in the second month. But we have this third month attached to it. So if we think about the second month representing this movement, then what is the third month? And, and I guess that's what you're going to be answering, right? Okay. Yes. But that's how I understand what you're asking. Well, taking the weight of these verses, mm -hmm. comparing them each against each other, we're seeing that the third month involved a work of restoration. It involved a work of cleansing of the house, but also to get rid of the idols. So that, the, so that the nation and the people could come into a covenant with God. Would you have a problem with that? Mm -hmm. No. The number one issue that I'm seeing is the church itself has not wanted to enter into a covenantal relationship with God. The church as a whole has said, I don't want to be ready for this. I don't want to give up my opinions of what I think. We can set aside what God has said. We're going to do fine because we're doing a work for him. Now, as we were going through this on Thursday, as was being pointed out in, this, in, in Thursday's study, we have where Moses had decided to listen to the advice of Zipporah regarding circumcising their youngest son. Uh -huh. Was this not an example of Moses setting aside the word of God? Uh -huh. So Moses could not be into a covenant with God when he's setting aside the word. Uh -huh. <clears throat> so here we have, we have an example. The man Moses, the man that stands head and shoulders above the entire Old Testament, was making a mistake to rely upon his wife for the situation with his son. We cannot afford to be making that kind of mistake at this time. We cannot afford to repeat 1888. Uh -huh. Now, when I'm saying something like that, let's remember, in 1888, not only did the church reject the message of righteousness by faith, which is the third angel's message, but it also chose to reject the fact that as Mrs. White and Jones and Wagner went forth from those meetings, what was being stated, never asked for money, never sought donations, but donations poured in in a great measure. And it scared the leadership of the church that they were losing control over the membership. Now, Thursday, the thought was presented 
that this movement is being raised up to give a message to Pharaoh. And the equivalence was given that Pharaoh is the church. What was Pharaoh's attitude when Moses and Aaron came before him? Who is this God that I should know him? Yeah, a little haughty. Very. He was quite haughty because he viewed himself as a God. <clears throat> now, we're coming to a point where there's going to be a message that will have to be given to the church. I can see that the church's attitude is going to be, we've been the keeper of the word for so many years. How come you think you know the word better than we do? All of these things we are studying because we're going to have to understand our message. We're going to have to understand the message that God would have us to give. Because there are going to be those that are going to reject this out of hand, just like what they've tried to do with the seven times. But the seven times of Leviticus are the message for the priests as we're covering out of the book of Malachi. So, I kind of remember a story where the, they, uh, they wanted to stay at a hand's distance because they didn't really want to listen to God in the first place. I think that was when they were um, there in uh, Horeb or not Horeb, wherever the mountaintop was. They didn't really want to hear him. It's the same today. Well, let's also remember that Elijah came before all of Israel. And what was his comment? What was it that Elijah said? He was the only one. He was the only one, but it was also a situation of make up your mind. Choose you this day who you will serve. Hmm. If yeah. Baal is Lord, serve him. If it is the Lord, serve him. Right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Okay. Now, I think these six verses have quite a bit of weight for us to consider. But we're going to go on. Now, what I, the next verse we're going to read, I'd like to hear from each of you to know, have you ever considered this? We're going to come into the third year. Deuteronomy 26, 12. When thou hast made an end of tithing all the tithes of thine increase, the third year, which is the year of tithing, and hath given it unto the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, that they may eat within thy gates and be filled. How many of us have ever considered the third year being the year of tithing? I've never heard that, actually. Ne never me. No, me neither. Okay. At least not with any impact. Yeah. Okay. Deuteronomy 14, 28. Right. So now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shift for just a moment. We're going to do a new share.
Okay. Now, can you see? Can you see this new screen? Uh -huh. Okay, we're gonna read, we're gonna go back over Malachi three. Then we're gonna go into portions of Deuteronomy fourteen. Malachi three eight. Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye have you are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even the whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith. Saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open to you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Is this not familiar to all of us? Have we not covered this in, in the last few weeks? Mm -hmm. Now, Deuteronomy 14, there are several portions of this, but we're going to be dealing with Deuteronomy 14 from 22 to the end. So, Deuteronomy 14, 22, tithing to be truly performed. <clears throat> 23, tithes and firstlings of cattle to be eaten before the Lord. Deuteronomy 14, 24, what is to be done in the case of a very distant abode or a distant house? And 14, 28, the third year's tithe of alms and charity. 14.22 reads, Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed and the field that bringeth forth year by year. <coughs> now, is there any, any problem with that verse? Do we have an understanding of what's being said here? Well, the seed you bring every year. Okay. One-tenth of it. Okay, now from the chat. God required of his ancient people three yearly gatherings. Three times in a year shall all thy males appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose, in the feast of unleavened bread, in the feast of weeks, and in the feast of tabernacles. And they shall not appear before the Lord empty. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord thy God, which he has given me no less than one third of their income was devoted to the sacred and religious purposes. Three testimonies, 395.3. So a comment again. Yes. Uh, Deuteronomy 14.22. I see three one twenties there. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, now that go ahead, Sorry. We discovered a lot of the symbology, you know, uh, the, these words that have been written down and studied for so long take even a, a greater uh, interest to me, um, becoming much more deep in the study. Is this not our Heavenly Father giving greater light upon his word for our time? I would have to say yes. Now, 1423. And thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose to place his name there. <clears throat> the tithe of thy corn, of thy wine, and of thy oil, and the firstlings of thy herd, and of thy flocks, that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. 1424. And if the way be too long for thee, so that thou art not able to carry it, or if the place be too far from thee, which the Lord thy God shall choose to set his name there, when the Lord thy God hath blessed thee, then thou shalt turn it into money, and bind up the money in thy hand, 
and shall go into the place which the Lord thy God shall choose. What, is, what does this say to you? I mean, I'm, I'm looking at this as a portion of the covenant. That for us to understand what the covenant is all about, we need to look at all of the aspects of the covenant. And thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul lustest after, for oxen, for sheep, or for wine, or for strong drink, or for whatsoever thy soul desireth. And thou shalt eat there before the Lord thy God, and thou shalt rejoice thou and thine household. And the Levite that is within thy gates, thou shalt not forsake him, for he hath no part nor inheritance with thee. <clears throat> now, at the end of three years, thou shalt bring forth all the tithe of thine increase the same year, and shall lay it up within thy gates. And the Levite, because he hath no part nor inheritance with thee, and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow, which are within thy gates, shall come and shall eat and be satisfied that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thine hand, which thou doest. Where is the definition given here? Of the storehouse. Where does it say that your tithes are to be given to the conference? What is it telling people is to be done? Now, I'm stepping on some very sacred toes here. Because I don't believe that, that we have in any manner truly looked to enter into covenant with God. <clears throat> We're coming to a point where there's going to be a message. In order for us to give that message, we are going to have to be completely, fully, and honestly in covenant with God to, for that message to go forward. I'm in full agreement that the message is very much representative of what Moses has gone through and that those tests that were given to Moses are going to symbolize tests that we're going to have. In all of the examples that we dealt with, if Moses had not, if Zipporah had not done for Moses, the circumcision that was to have been done with their, their youngest child, then Moses would not have been able to go forward. Does not, does not that tell us how important the covenant is for us. Now, when we were studying uh, Malachi, yes, we were applying it symbolically, right? Effectively. So how are we applying this then? The point being, is not a tithe symbolically related to circumcision? Is this not an outward showing that we honor God in everything that we're doing? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's also a symbol of the remnant. Okay. Because the remnant is a tenth as well. So if it's a symbol of the remnant, if it's a symbol of circumcision, is this not an agreement to enter into the covenant? Mm -hmm. So if it's an agreement to enter into the covenant, Is it not something that is important for our time right now? If we enter into the covenant and are blessed by the covenant, then it behooves us then to share that blessings with the Levites and everybody else as part of their inheritance that they don't have access to yet. Okay. Nicely addressed. Now, as we look at Deuteronomy 26, <clears throat> and it shall be when thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance, and possessest it and dwellest therein, that thou shalt take of the first of all the fruit of the earth, which shalt, thou shalt bring of thy land that the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shall put it in a basket. And shall go into the place which the Lord thy God shall choose to place his name there. So what's the symbol of the fruit in a basket? What do you think? Why is it important that that first fruit go into a basket? Apart and protected from the rest. I can barely hear you. Sorry. Set apart and protected from the rest. Exactly. Is it not also a another symbol of remnant? So if it's set apart, if it's being protected, is this not a symbol of the movement? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And thou shalt go unto the priest that shall be in those days and say unto him, I profess this day unto the Lord thy God that I am come unto the country which the Lord swear unto our fathers for to give us. Are we not to come unto Christ? which is our priest in these days. Mm -hmm. Are we not to recognize our willingness to enter into this covenant to do as he would direct? This is not saying to us, turn to a man. We are to take our reliance completely and totally upon Christ. And the priest shall take the basket out of thine hand and set it down before the altar of the Lord thy God. And thou shalt speak and say before the Lord thy God, a Syrian ready to perish was my father. And he went down into Egypt and sojourned there with a few and became a nation, great, mighty, and populous. <clears throat> what's being said here? What story is being repeated in these few words? Well, the stories of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, isn't it specifically that for Jacob? Yeah.
and the Egyptians evil entreated us and afflicted us and laid upon us hard bondage. So is this not also addressing us today? Because the church made the decision to accept the evil of rejecting Miller's rules? And has it not been hard bondage to give the true gospel? And when we cried unto the Lord God of our fathers, the Lord heard our voice and looked upon our affliction and our labor and our oppression. And the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with great terribleness and with signs and with wonders. Is this not God taking control of the movement? Uh -huh. And he hath brought us into this place and hath given us this land, even a land that floweth with milk and honey. Now let's remember first fruits or remnant can be a tithe. That eat the ephah was the tenth part of a homer, Ezekiel forty five eleven. <clears throat> and now behold, I have brought the first fruits of the land which thou, O Lord, hast given me, and thou shalt set it before the Lord thy God and worship before the Lord thy God. And thou shalt rejoice in every good thing which the Lord thy God has given unto thee. And unto thine house, thou and the Levite and the stranger that is among you. When thou hast made an end of tithing, all the tithes of thy increase the third year, which is the year of tithing. And hast given it unto the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, that they may eat within thy gates and be filled. Then thou shalt say before the Lord thy God, I have brought away the hollowed things out of mine house, and also have given them unto the Levite, and unto the stranger, to the fatherless, and to the widow, according to all thy commandments, which thou hast commanded me. I have not transgressed thy commandments, neither have I forgotten them. What's being said here? Well, the tithes of all the, the increase, um, they're supposed to bring in the third year, and this is going to go to the Levite, the stranger, and the fatherless, so the orphans, and the widow, so that they can eat. So in this seven-year period, you have a third year, right? Mm -hmm. You also have a sixth year, right? Is that sixth year not a doubling? Okay. So you're saying that every third year, not just the third, third year within a sabbatical cycle. I'm asking the question. Yes. Okay. Hmm. I don't know. See, there's so much that we have not really looked at regarding mm -hmm. the sabbatical cycles, mm -hmm. regarding the economy of what was to be done in Israel, <clears throat> regarding the covenant, that we need to be able to look at this, especially from the minor prophets, and line this out with the book of Daniel 
to come to a better understanding of where we are to be at this time. And our time is short. I have not eaten thereof in my morning, neither have I taken any aught therefore for any unclean use, nor given aught therefore for the dead. But I have hearkened to the voice of the Lord my God, and have done according to all that thou hast commanded me. Look down from thy holy habitation from heaven, and bless thy people Israel, and the land which thou hast given us, as thou swearest unto our fathers, a land that floweth with milk and honey. This day, the Lord thy God hath commanded thee to do these statutes and judgments, and thou shalt therefore keep and do them with all mine heart and with all thy soul. Thou hast Avouch the Lord this day to be thy God and to walk in his ways and to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and to hearken unto his voice. Is this what we have been doing or are we doing what the church has told us to do? And the Lord hath avouched thee this day to be his peculiar people, as he hath promised thee, and that thou shouldest keep all his commandments, and to make thee high above all nations, which he hath made in praise, in name, and in honor, that thou mayest be an holy people unto the Lord thy God, as he has spoken. How can we be that holy people if we are not willing to accept his word totally? What are your thoughts? I, for the thinking outside the box, I see Jesus saying to the Father, I have gathered these remnants and put them in a basket as a tithe to thee as a promise. And as they're gathered and put together in a movement or whatever way you would look at it, they then become a blessing to everybody else. And it's him that's making the covenant with us. And once he does that, we should obey his word. I can't disagree with you. I'm not, I'm not about to try. Christ is making this covenant. Is it not for us as well to accept this covenant? We've had a covenant that has been presented. We've had a covenant that God has sought to enter into with us. He has sought to enter into this covenant since 1850. He repeated that covenant again in 1888. Within six years of the 1850 chart, the church was fully in Laodicea. Within 13 years, it had abandoned the chart in full. By 1888, or 25 years after that, we have a leadership that chose not to accept the message which in spirit and in truth 
was the message of the third angel. Now, if you're not accepting the message of the third angel, what message are you accepting? If you're rejecting the warning of the third angel of Revelation 14, what message have you taken and accepted? Well, the mark of the beast. Exactly. That is a fearsome thought to me. Now, okay. So, <clears throat> as we look to continue with this from the third year, Deuteronomy 26.12 gave me quite a shock. But I'm having to consider this as being the third year was the year of tithing. <clears throat> now, 1 Kings 15.28. Even in the third year of Asa, king of Judah, did Basha slay him and reigned in his stead. 15.33. In the third year of Asa, king of Judah, began Basha, the son of Ahijah to reign over all Israel in Tizra, 20 and four years. So here is Asa being killed and someone else ruling. First Kings 18, one. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year saying, go shoe themselves, thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. This is the third year of drought. The third year where they had no provender for the animals. The land was desolate. Yet when we compare this against Deuteronomy 26, 12, had they been in covenant relationship with God, they would not have been able to have a place to hold all of the blessings that God had provided them. First Kings 22, and they continued three years without war between Syria and Israel. And it came to pass in the third year that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, came down to the king of Israel. Do you remember what the story is here, Theodore? Um, First Kings 22. No, I don't. Okay. Uh, oh, the story of Ahab and the false prophets. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. So, so where, where part, Ahab, Ahab's going to be killed. Right? Yeah. Had Ahab walked properly before God? No, not at all. What covenant did he enter into that he was not to enter into? A covenant with Ben Hadad. Did he also not enter into a covenant with Jezebel? 
Well, a marriage covenant, yes. So here he is. He enters into a marriage covenant with those of the land around him. And he enters into a covenant with Ben Hadad that he should not have entered into. Mm -hmm. So was he not turning his back on God in two ways? Mm -hmm. Most certainly. Now, in this situation, he was choosing to listen to the word of his wife who did not honor God and he chooses to go into this covenant with Ben Hadad, another one that does not honor God. <clears throat> so, Ahab chose a covenant that was not of God. Second Kings 18.1 now it came to pass in the third year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Here we are dating when Hezekiah comes to the throne. Second Kings 19.29 And this shall be a sign unto thee. Ye shall eat this year such things as grow of themselves, and in the second year that which springeth of the same, and in the third year sow ye, and reap, and plant vineyards, and eat the fruits thereof. What are we seeing here? Well, this is commonly understood as being a jubilee cycle. Agreed. But I'm not sure if that's actually what's occurring here. Because um, uh, I looked into this quite a bit. Okay. Because there's a lot of people who try to mark this as a jubilee year based upon this. And, and I think it's actually a sign, uh, not so much of the jubilee cycle, but just of what's going to happen. So um can't remember all the details, but so this is this being that Isaiah here was prophesying Shanacharib's fall. Yeah, so that's uh yeah. Correct. Yeah, because I looked into this before. I don't remember all the details of it, but so in the reign of Hezekiah again, so we have, uh, that's where we get the story of Rabshaki at the, um, the conduit of the opera pool by the Fuller's Field. Okay. But isn't it interesting that we have this portion from 2 Kings 19 that's repeated in Isaiah 37.30? Mm -hmm. So, if we're repeating this, is this also not a symbol of the second angel's message? Mm -hmm. Most certainly. Mm -hmm. So, why is this repeat of the second angel's message so important for us today? We heed its warnings and don't fall into the same errors they did. Well, it's Revelation 18. It's the message of the, the Sunday law. Okay, but is this also not is this not filled with symbolism regarding this third year? Mm -hmm. So 
So could we then say that 2021 was the third year or would we be looking at 2022 as the third year? Well, I don't know if we're going to take it that literally, but... Um... And where are we going to count from? Well, if you're going to count from November 9th, then 2021 is the third year. Okay. If you count from July 18th, then 2022 is the third year. If you're going to count from 2020. But I mean, I'm not sure if you would take it that literally. I'm giving a what if for right. consideration. I mean, definitely sy symbolically, I understand from November 9th to December 31st is a symbol of the third year. Okay. That's the symbol of our message because it, it occurs in these three years. And we have these three Sabbaths, which is right. the seven, seven in a period of seven, seven, seven days that are particularly marked. So I would take it more, I mean, symbolically, the, the, these three days relate to our, or three years relate to our three years of our 777 structure. Okay. I mean, I'm granting you, we're tying in one of the more major prophets here with the minor prophets, but it's giving a a representation of the second angel's message. And you could be very correct that it's giving a, a, a more correct representation of the message of revelation 18, but it is a message for our time. Mm Also in the third year of his reign, he sent to his princes, even to Ben-Hale and to Obadiah and to Zechariah and to Nethaniel and to Micaiah to teach the cities of Judah. Ten chapters later, he fought also with the king of the Ammonites and prevailed against them and the children of Ammon of Ammon gave him the same year and hundred talents of silver and 10,000 measures of wheat and 10,000 of barley. So much did the children of Ammon pay unto him both the second year and the third. Kind of interesting to see what kind of a tribute was being given. Okay, so in the first one, you got Jehoshaphat, and then this second quote here in Second Chronicles 27, you have Jothan, right? So from Jehoshaphat to Jothan. Mm -hmm. Is there some kind of a symbolism in this? Yes, there is. Okay. So... Um, now, dealing with our prophetic mirror, um, our chronology, um, we know that there's uh, um, 151 years uh, from 1863 to 2014, correct? Right. Now, if we were to go back from... 742 BC, 151 years, because um, that's where our pro prophetic mirror starts. 151 years. It brings us to 893 BC. And the significance of that has to do with uh, Jehoshaphat and um, Jotam. So this is 
Um, what year did I say there? I added that together. 893. 893. And, okay, so that's going to be, in 893 is when Jehoshaphat's reign ends and Jehoram's reign begins. Okay. Is what happens. Now, uh, so that's the, the connection between Jehoshaphat. Um, and, and Jehoshaphat's going to have a two-year co- co-regency with Jehoram. And then with Jotham, that's going to be uh, quite a bit later. That's going to be 758. And that's he's going to be the last king. He's the father of Ahaz. So it, that connects uh, Jotham's going to die in the year that the, uh, the prophetic mirror the 2,604 year prophetic mirror begins. So that's the connection between Jotham and uh, Jehoshaphat. And Je- Does that make sense to people? Do people need to see that illustrated? I think can so. I just, I think I- can I just share my screen here? Sure. Hang on. Okay. So, well, I can just, I can just super, super override you here. There you go. Okay, so I'm just showing you here. This is the chart of the kings of of Judah here on the left, and you can see uh, Jehoshaphat. He's going to reign for 25 years, and his reign will end in 893. That's 151 years prior to the start of the prophetic mirror. So that is, if we take our prophetic mirror that ends in 1863 and we count the 151 years based upon 151 shekels of Ezekiel 45, 12, taking instead of 50, um, uh, 50 shekels in a manna, we put 60 shekels in a manna, right? That's going to bring us to 2014. But if we go backwards from 742, which is when Ahaz begins to reign, that's at the death of Jotham, we, it brings us back to Jehoshaphat, to his death in, in 893, or the end of his reign in 893. So, so, so that's 151 years from 742. So you can see these two verses that you gave. They're connecting that 151 years. Right. Okay. So, so you can go back and share that so so i think that's quite significant hugely significant esther 1 3 in the third year of his reign he made a feast unto all his princes and his servants the power of persian and media the nobles and the princes of the provinces being before him Here we have the feast that is outlined in Esther 1. As we studied this before, Mm -hmm. this feast went on, did we not say, for a total of 187 days? Yep, 187. 180 and then seven. seven. And it's going to begin on the first day of the first month and end on the 10th day of the seventh month. So we have a feast that begins on the first day of that first month. It ends on the 10th day of the seventh month. It ends on the day of atonement. Mm -hmm. Which happens to be a Sabbath that year. Right. Now we note three times in the book of Daniel. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. Daniel 8.1. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. Here again, third year of Jehoiakim, third year of Belshazzar. 
And the last verse, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar. And the thing was true, and the time appointed was long, and he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. Daniel 10.1. What is the thing that was true? And why was it so important at that point to understand the mare, not the calzone? Or is this not giving reference to the understanding of the 2,300 days of Daniel 8? Yeah. Well, well, the word there translated thing is the Hebrew word debar, which normally is just translated um, like as a matter um, subject. It's the topic <laughs> of something. So. And it's related to the, uh, it also means a word, right? So often it's used in, in the case of something like, um, uh, um, the word of the Lord came unto, right? So that's the right. word. The and so it's a very, very common word in the Bible. I think it occurs, you know, well, hundreds of times, but. That was a knock? Yeah, that was a knock. Okay. Okay. So the third year has something of import for us as well. She's here. Okay. Capital. Okay. Now we come. We have 40 years. We're going to compare some things here in 40 years. And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padanaram, the sister to Laban, the Syrian. So are we not seeing here, here is Isaac entering into a covenantal relationship. Now we look at his son. And Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Biri the Hittite, and Bashemath, the daughter of Elon the Hittite. Father and son, both seeking to enter into covenant relationship at 40, one entering into a covenant in the order of God, one choosing to reject the covenant of God. Mm -hmm. And the children of Israel did eat manna 40 years until they came to a land inhabited. They did eat manna until they came unto the borders of the land of Canaan. Why did they eat the manna for 40 years? Did this not occur because they had rejected God's instruction to go into this land? Mm -hmm. So they rejected the covenant that God had offered. Now, as Nehemiah saw this, thou gavest also thy good spirit to instruct them and withheldest not thy manna from their mouth and gavest them water for their thirst. Yea, 40 years did thou sustain them in the wilderness so that they lacked nothing. Their closed wax not old and their feet swelled not. 40 years God took care of them. 40 years, here again, 
is a symbol of the covenant. Numbers 14.33. And your children shall wander in the wilderness 40 years and bear your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. Using the alternate reading. And the number of the days which ye search the land, even 40 days each day for a year, shall ye bear your iniquities even 40 years, and ye shall know altering of my purpose. Why is it important for, for this portion, this alternate, to be here for us? Could you repeat that again? Okay. Why is it important for this alternate reading to be presented for our consideration? <clears throat> the original reading is this. After the number of days in which he searched the land, even 40 days, each day for a year, shall ye bear your iniquities, even 40 years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. Does God ever breach his own promises? Never. Here was the children of Israel, however, that caused an altering of God's purpose. It needs to be specifically presented. God does not breach his promise. We have forced the altering of his purpose. Amen. We cannot afford at our time, at this time in our history, for any kind of altering of God's purpose. We need to be cooperating with him. Numbers 32, 13. And the Lord's anger was kindled against Israel, and he made them wander in the wilderness 40 years until all the generation that had done evil in the sight of the Lord was consumed. If we're not going to enter into a covenant relationship, we are doing evil. Mm -hmm. Do we wish to be part of a generation that is consumed? Deuteronomy 2. That's the testing question, isn't it? Well, it should be. Should we not test ourselves according to this, according to God's word? For the Lord thy God has blessed thee in all the works of thy hand. He knoweth thy walking through this great wilderness these 40 years. The Lord thy God has been with thee. Thou Past lacked nothing. We are coming to a point very, very soon, within, let's say, roughly 40 days, that we will see about the 730th day of 30 days to flatten the curve. Have we lacked for anything mm -hmm. over these last two years? No. Has our Heavenly Father not provided mm -hmm. us with everything that we've needed in abundance? 
Have we mm-hmm. praised him for his loving kindness and his watchfulness over us? Deuteronomy 8, 1 to 4. All the commandments which I have commanded thee this day shall be observed to do, that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the way the Lord the God has led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldst keep his commandments or no. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with the manna, which thou knewest not, neither did their fathers know. And he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the word of the Lord doth man live. Thy raiment wax not old upon thee, neither did thy foot swell these forty years. Why is Deuteronomy 8.3 so important for us? Is this not one of the responses that the Savior gave to the adversary when he was being tempted? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> So is this not an example of how we are to meet the issues that we will face with a very plain, thus saith the Lord? Absolutely. Deuteronomy 29, 4, 5, and 6. Yet the Lord hath not given you an heart to perceive and eyes to see and ears to hear until this day. And I have led you 40 years in the wilderness. Your clothes are not waxen old upon you, and thy shoe is not waxen old upon thy foot. Ye have not eaten bread, neither have ye drunk wine or strong drink, that ye might know that I am the Lord thy God. Now all the people came out were circumcised, but the people that were born in the wilderness by the way, as they came forth out of Egypt, them they had not circumcised. For the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness till all the people that were men of war, which came out of Egypt were consumed because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord unto whom the Lord sware that he would not show them the land, which the Lord sware unto their fathers that he would give us, a land that flowed with milk and with honey. <clears throat> so, reject covenant, you will wander. Can we afford to be wandering today? No. Then what are we to do? Here's Caleb. Joshua 14. Then the children of Judah came unto Joshua in Gilgal. And Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said unto him, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord has said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me and thee in Kadesh Barnea. Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to a spy unto the land. And I brought him word again, as it was in mine heart. 
the word of Caleb like the word of Joshua. This is a goodly land. We can take it because they had their faith in God. Is this not the same faith that we are to have today? Is this not how we are to walk before the Lord today? In spirit and in truth, in faith, in everything that he has presented before us. As we've compared these things today, we have looked upon some items that we have not in the past considered. It is not that they have not been in scripture. It is that we have not had them revealed to us as to the import for ourselves today. We have to come to an understanding of what the minor prophets are saying to us is important so that we may more fully and completely come to an understanding of what our Heavenly Father would require of us. Then we may be prepared to enter into a covenant, then we are going to be prepared to give a message. Shall we pray? Gracious Father, we know so little. We need you, Father, to guide us. We need you to show us that which we need to understand for this time. As you've given test to Moses, you are giving test to us. We need you, Father, to direct us in all of these ways to prepare us for the work that you would have us to do. Help us so that we may, as Caleb and Joshua had done, walk in faith of your word, accepting that you are capable and able to do exactly as you promise you will do. Prepare us to this end. Guide us in this way. For this, Father, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Recording stop. Thank you. Recording. Thank you. Just-